Hi there. I am on the scikit-learn documentation page, and in particular, I am exploring the API reference over here. You can see on the left-hand side that there are lots of submodules that I could go ahead and explore, but there is one submodule that I think might deserve a little bit of extra attention. And that is this utils module over here that contains all sorts of utilities that scikit-learn likes to use. Some of these are meant for more internal use, but you could also definitely use some of these tools yourself. Just to explore some of the things in here, there is this function called estimator underscore HTML wrapper. And this function can be used to take any scikit-learn estimator and turn that into a nice HTML representation for inside of your Jupyter Notebook. There's also a decorator called deprecated that scikit-learn likes to use to indicate when something will be gone in a future version. That's definitely a useful thing to have in a library. But there's one utility in particular that I really want to zoom in on in this video. And that's this one, the check x, y one. The interesting thing about this utility is that most scikit-learn estimators really rely on it. It is a utility that checks the input data as well as the labels before it is handled by a scikit-learn estimator. Different estimators have different assumptions about the data that go in, and it's this utility that can check whether or not those assumptions hold. And there's actually quite a lot happening inside of this function, so let's go and explore it. So let's now explore inside of a Jupyter Notebook. Just to get the ball rolling, I figured I might start by making a classification dataset using the make classification function inside of scikit-learn. This gives me a data set to then go ahead and train a model on, and I figured logistic regression would do. And you can see in the base behavior, everything is just smooth sailing. X goes in, Y goes in, and what I get out over here is a trained model. But let's now make a very small change. I am importing NumPy over here, and I'm doing that because that gives me access to this not a number indicator. And what that allows me to do is it allows me to take one point in the array of X and set that to a not available number. And just to highlight that, when I inspect the array, you can actually see the culprit. There's this one value over here that's just missing, so to say. And just for good measure, let's now actually see what happens if I were to retrain a logistic regression with a data set like this one. It was totally running fine before, but now we can see that there's an error being thrown. And the fact that we're throwing an error here makes sense, but let's take a closer look at the uh, stack trace. Because if we scroll down far enough, then we see the check x, y function. This function can do a lot of checking for a lot of different things. And a typical thing to check for is to ensure that the data that we have doesn't contain missing values. And if we were to scroll down further, you can actually see that that's the case. We can see the proper value error over here that it's being raised. And we also get a hint on how we might be able to fix it. In this particular case, it is telling us that we might be able to use a histogram gradient boosted classifier instead. As we will see in a moment though, this histogram gradient boosted classifier, even though it can deal with missing values, it cannot deal with every data structure that goes in. If you've seen previous videos in this series, then you may be aware that this estimator has an internal mechanism to deal with missing values. That is why if I were to set a missing value, that I can still go ahead and train this model. That will all totally still work just fine. However, there is one change I can make that this classifier cannot deal with. And that change is being shown here. What I'm doing here isn't something you would ever really do in real life, but just to prove the point, I'm importing this function over here that can turn a normal NumPy array into a sparse representation. This function is meant for NumPy arrays that have a lot of zeros in them. But theoretically, you can also get a sparse data structure out for non-sparse data. Again, in real life, this would not be a thing that you would normally do, but just to prove a point, notice what happens if I were to pass sparse data to this histogram gradient boosted classifier. We are totally seeing an error happen here. However, when we scroll down, we see a different checking function being triggered. Instead of check x, y, we see check array being triggered over here. The thinking is still relatively the same though. However, there's an interesting implementation detail 
hidden under the hood here. That also helps explain why there's a distinction between the check xy function and the check array function. So, all right, we're dealing with two functions. We've got check array and we have check xy. We're going to dive into the code in a bit, but I kind of want to explain a phenomenon in terms of code organization first. The check xy function actually makes use of the check array function internally. However, this might make you wonder why these functions both exist. It feels like one of these two functions is more general, so why don't we use that most of the time? And this is where the boosted models are actually pretty interesting. You see, we've got this histogram boosted classifier, but we've also got this histogram boosted regressor. And although these two models are totally different, you can imagine that they also overlap in terms of the functionality. Both of these two models use boosting, both of these two models have lots of trees that need to be trained, so you can smell from a distance that maybe it makes sense that they were both to inherit from a shared code base. And as we'll see later, uh, they actually do import from the same class. There is this general class that they both inherit from, basically to make sure that we don't duplicate code unnecessarily. However, that also means when the dot fit method is called of this general class, that technically we need to do some extra things to figure out if we are dealing with a classifier or a regressor. And it's in these situations that you can hopefully imagine that it could be more useful to have a specific array checking mechanism as opposed to a more general one. So with that little bit of extra knowledge, let's now actually look at the code. I am on GitHub now, and I'm looking at the source code of scikit-learn. In particular, I'm having a look at the gradient underscore boosting.py file, where you'll be able to find this implementation. It contains all the code for the histogram gradient boosting regressor. Just from this line though, there are some interesting things we can see. This class inherits from not one, but two base classes. One of them is a base class from scikit-learn that basically indicates that we're dealing with a regression model, but we also seem to be dealing with this one over here, this based hist gradient boosting class. The interesting thing is that this class does not implement a dot fit method, but this class does. And there's also a reason for it. If you scroll down a bit further, you can see that we also have this other class. This is the histogram gradient boosting classifier. As opposed to the regressor, this one inherits from a classifier mixin, but you will also notice that it still inherits from this general base hist gradient boosting class. Once again, this class does not implement a fit method, but this one does. This class is doing something general that is shared across multiple models. And from implementation standpoint, that's kind of nice because it means there's one place where the code lives. There's no duplication of code that's required. We just have one place where all the fitting uh, needs to happen. Speaking of which, let's have a look at that fit method. The fit method over here belongs to the base hist gradient boosting class that I mentioned earlier. And we'll just have a quick look inside. If I scroll down a little bit here, we can see that there is this function called underscore preprocess x. And it's this function that is using the check array method that I mentioned earlier. There's a bunch of stuff that we're checking in here, but all of these things are related to the X array that goes in. But you'll notice that the Y array over here, that has a separate checking method. And you'll also notice that the checking method doesn't just receive Y, it also receives the estimator that is currently making use of the fit method. Put differently, the self that goes in here, that is going to be able to tell us if we're dealing with a classifier or a regressor. So to perhaps put it simply, when you look at the scikit-learn codebase, odds are that you'll find this check underscore x underscore y function in a lot of places. However, there are these moments like what we see over here when we're dealing with a class that technically could be a regressor or a classifier that you might see some other checking methods instead. And usually you will notice that under the hood, they will be using this check array function instead. Under the hood, this check xy call is using this check array function, 
But the main point that I'm trying to drive home here is just how many of these checks scikit-learn is doing on your behalf. And a lot of these checks do find their way into these utilities that are general. That is super nice for the ecosystem because it means that third-party plugins can also use these methods. But depending on the estimator, there are still these needs to do something custom, like what we see over here. Hopefully at this point, you have gained a renewed appreciation for some of these utility methods. In particular, this check XY and this check array one. There are lots of these different properties that different estimators would like to check before actually running the train loop. And maybe this will also help motivate you to spend some time reading the docs on this topic. There really are a lot of these different settings that are interesting to dive into because some models do really tend to care about it. However, as a way to maybe end this video, I figured I might also share a bit of a preview. What you're looking at here are the release notes for scikit-learn 1.6, and there is a enhancement that is going to happen in that check array function. As of version 1.6, you can use that one method to check whether or not the array only has positive numbers going in. Before, there was a separate checking function to just check for that one fact, but these things can be consolidated in a more general function. And that's what's going to happen in version 1.6. It's changes like this that can get lost in the larger scheme of things sometimes. But hopefully by now you can appreciate that having these methods be quite bespoke, but at the same time being very configurable is a nice thing because data really does need to be checked before a training loop starts.